today's scripture reading is from Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in the chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of good will. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. May the Lord bless this reading. From his holy word. You know, sometimes in life we experience pain. We encounter heartache. We things that cause us to ask questions. There are those things, you know, those situations that simply drain our energy. And you'll find that oftentimes the pain is just too great without the strength and comfort of the Holy Spirit. We serve a God of no limits. We can call on God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly. Is there a limit to his strength? Is there a limit to his strength? No. No. Is there a limit to his wisdom and knowledge? No. Is there a limit to his patience? No. No. There is, uh, unfortunately, a limit to my patience, but I'm working on it. And is there a limit to his love and to his mercy? No. no. Because God works beyond the limits of man. And so join me today as we call on him for full strength. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I give you the glory and honor. I thank you, Father, that when I am weak, you are strong. You are the one that takes me, puts me together, and lifts me up. It is indeed a privilege to approach your throne, knowing that you love and care for me in a way that I could never understand or repay. See my weakness. I come to seek strength from you, Lord. With everything that weighs me down, the cares of life, everything that has crushed my joy, I ask for your help and for your strength, Lord. May you equip me to handle life's difficulties as they threaten to overwhelm me. 
Reach down, Lord, from the heavens above and touch me in my weak state. Put my faith back together, Lord, so that I may be strong in you, in your strength. In Philippians 4, 13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, I believe that through you I can overcome the temptations and the testing of my faith that I face. I want to be delivered by your loving arms when my back is against the wall and when I feel like all is lost. I ask that you come in and show your power. Show your might and turn situations around for me. I desire to have strong faith to serve you continually. I desire to have strength, Lord, to resist temptation. I ask you, I ask that you will fortify my spirit and my mind so that I am able to withstand the challenges and to say no to worldly temptations. Help me to be sober, to be alert, and to guard my mind against things that threaten to corrupt my thinking, giving me the strength to run this race, Lord. May you increase the voice of the Holy Spirit, a voice that will remind me that your grace is sufficient and your strength is perfect. Lord, the psalmist tells me in Psalm 46, verse 1, that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. This means that you're always there for me and that's why I can trust you. I can trust you to give me the strength to rise above bad habits, grant me the strength to forgive those who've wronged me, and to love my enemies as you require. Remind me, Holy Spirit, that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength so that I may wait upon the Lord each and every day. Strengthen me while I wait to hear from you when my prayers seem unanswered and I feel like I'm calling out in vain. May you comfort my heart and strengthen my faith and help me to understand that your will is perfect and your timing is right. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And good morning again. Uh, and it's it's always good to be together and to be in the house of the Lord. And we are we are here not just to worship our Lord in song, but we're here to worship Him through His Word. And that took me a long time to really grasp that concept that we are to worship God as we recognize him and as he reveals himself to us and and as we as the light turn it gets turned on in our thinking and in our hearts and lives as we're sitting here listening to him speaking to us that's worship and then our response is to give him his worth his due and to be in awe of him revealing himself and speaking to our hearts so if you can turn in your bibles to that passage that diana read for us Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. 26. What did I say? 12 to 26, sorry. Thank you. Yes, I should know what I'm preaching on. And uh, Well, we said earlier, or last week, when we started this series, the book here that Paul is writing, this epistle to the Philippians, this letter, is often called the epistle of joy. And we have been talking about struggling and uh, having pain in our lives, some of the hymns and songs and uh, Brock's prayer. And the truth in this book is that we can actually have real happiness, true, lasting, Happiness, we can have spiritual or godly joy no matter what happens around us. The joy of the Lord isn't based 
on my circumstances. It's about having a right relationship with God, with the living God. It's about having that right heart attitude and that right heart condition. Real joy is having a quiet, confident assurance of God's love and his work and his presence in our lives. And it's when we start trusting him and trusting his plan and starting to trust his way and his design and his purposes. That's the only way we can have lasting joy in spite of what's going on around us. And when we think of it, so many people today, that's their, their goal in life. There was a movie with Will Smith a few years ago called The Pursuit of Happiness. And that's even in the American Constitution. People in this world want to be happy. That's our natural desire. And we chase that elusive dream our entire lives. Spending money, collecting things, having lots of friends, searching for new experiences, and yet human happiness depends on that. It depends on our circumstances. And the question is, what happens when things change? What happens when the rug gets pulled out from under us and the toys get rusty and our friends leave and our loved ones die and our health deteriorates and our money's gone? John 15, 10 to 11, this is Jesus talking. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Your happiness would be complete. How? By keeping His commandments and remaining in Him, remaining in His love. So real, lasting, spiritual joy, happiness comes from God. It's based on, on, on who He is and what He's done. And human happiness is different. It's temporary, it's fleeting, it's based on what happens in my life. The joy of the Lord is permanent. And we said last week that the Apostle Paul who writes this letter is a living example of this because he's writing this epistle of joy. Where? From prison in Rome to the church at Philippi in modern day Greece, and he's under house arrest in Rome. Have you ever heard that expression when it comes to dieting or exercising, no pain, no gain? And so oftentimes I put off exercising or I put off dieting because I don't want to go through the pain of starving myself or watching TV at night and not eating anything. That's painful. Or start thinking about exercise at my age. Oh man, I'm gonna be so sore the next day. It's gonna be so hard and so difficult. So we're gonna call this sermon, Gain in Spite of Pain. And when we think of that concept, we just kind of, uh, Focus in on get that concept. It's kind of an oxymoron, really. How can I gain anything through something painful? My natural thinking is that nothing good, like happiness or joy, can come out of something bad, like pain. So I looked up the definition of an oxymoron. And it, it means a figure of speech that seems to contradict itself, that seems to be the opposite. And, of, and it seems to be. And of course, we use all sorts of oxymorons in the English language, things like jumbo shrimp, and pretty ugly, and holy war, and work, party, alone, together, hot, chilly, Student, teacher, old news, good grief, <laughs> crash, landing, fairly cloudy, original copies, clearly confused, inside, out, same difference, dull roar, stop quickly, boneless ribs, artificial grass, 
Exact, exact opposite, genuine imitation, numb feeling, passive resistance, resident alien, near miss, almost exactly, and the list could go on and on. When I taught English in Korea, I had this uh, Korean teacher uh, who could speak fairly fluent English, but she would ask me, usually most shifts I would start, and she would ask me, oh, John, how are you doing? And I would say, oh, pretty good. I said, pretty good. How, how does pretty and good go along? Why, why do you say pretty? You're beautiful and good? That doesn't make any sense. So the English language. And Jesus himself, of course, used a lot of opposites. And oxymorons, morons, you have to die in order to live, Jesus said. You have to lose yourself in order to find yourself. You have to, you, you, you have to be last in, in order to be first. And here in our passage, we have this very basic truth, this very basic biblical principle, and it seems to be the opposite. Gain in spite of pain. And in other words, joyful pain. Joyful suffering, joyful persecution. Oh yeah, bring it on. <laughs> Most of us do not have that mindset or that way of thinking. We have a hard time with that because naturally in our humanness, we can't stand pain. We can't see any gain if we have to go through something that is painful and times of suffering. And now we're gonna look at our passage and we're gonna look at, at Philippians chapter one, verses 12 to 26, and we're gonna look at three pains that Paul goes through, the Apostle Paul. Three pains in his life that he expresses in this passage. Three pains and three gains. So we wanna look at three painful aspects of the Apostle Paul's life that turned into gain, into something positive and something joyful. And it can happen for us too. So number one, here's the first pain. And they all just happen to start with the letter C. The first painful aspect of Paul's life. And with him writing this letter is an obvious one. He's in chains. He's in prison. He's held captive. So the first C is his chains. Look at verses 12 to 14. And he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard in Rome, Caesar's palace, and to everyone else, that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the Christians in Rome, in the Roman church, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So because of his pain being in chains, the local Christians are proclaiming the gospel without fear. And at the beginning here, Paul says, I want you to know what has happened to me. And we need to ask the question, so what exactly happened to Paul that caused him, well, he's ending up here in prison now, he's in chains, he's in the city of Rome where he's writing from, how, how did he end up there? What happened? Well, the book of Acts gives us a little bit of background and we're told that Paul was arrested at the temple in Jerusalem and then spent two years in a prison in Caesarea and then he was asked, to have a trial in front of the, the Roman Caesar, and so he was sent to Rome. And on the way in, on the ship, uh, the ship went down, and uh, he was stranded in Malta for three months, and finally he makes it to Rome through all of that ordeal. And for a long time, Paul had been wanting to preach the gospel in Rome, in the capital city of the empire. But he never thought it would be done in that way. He thought he might take a cruise ship or a direct flight or something like that. 
And now all of that happened in order for God to work things out, to allow Paul to come to Rome in God's way, not Paul's way. And now he's under house arrest and he's chained to the Roman guard and you would think that would probably be the end of Paul. And he's awaiting trial that could possibly lead to his death. And you know, most of us really don't know what it is like to be in literal chains. But maybe you're someone here this morning and you feel like you're in spiritual chains. And you're in an emotional prison or a spiritual prison or you feel trapped or you feel confined, you feel like there's no way out. There's no freedom, there's no deliverance. Maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's a habit, or it's a lifestyle that you can't seem to get out of and you feel like you're held captive. And on the other side is, what if it was literal? What if things changed in our world and our society and persecution came and it was against the law to be a Christian? <laughs> or to preach the word, or share the gospel, and we ended up in prison. How do we deal with that? Could we see any hope in that situation? Any joy, any happiness? Well, the word of God gives us amazing hope from this passage. Gain can even come out of that kind of pain being in emotional chains or being in literal chains, being in prison for the faith. And Paul says, look what he says in verse 12. What has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Go figure. God can even use our chains for something good, to advance his work and to advance the gospel. And look what happens in verse 13. He says, throughout all the palace guard. This is talking about the Praetorian Roman guard. They were the elite. They were the imperial soldiers of the empire. They were kind of like the secret service, I think. And there were thousands of them. And they kept the law. And they, they were like a police force in the capital city. And Paul says, all these guards know about me. And they know what I stand for. And they know my message. And then on top of that, look at verse 14. He says that the Christians in Rome have become more confident in the Lord and more bold in their faith. And they have more courage because of Paul's example. And if Paul had arrived in Rome from the Middle East on a cruise ship, it probably wouldn't have happened. And they start sharing the gospel. And instead of retreating and cowering, they're gaining and growing and becoming a stronger church. So in spite of the pain of having chains, God is using even that kind of pain to advance his gospel. You know, when I think of my own life, I think of my dear wife, we have gone through things in our lives where we felt trapped. We felt like we were in chains. We felt like we were in prison. And we never thought that anything good could even come out, barely come out of our prison situations. And yet often when you've gone through those tough times, those hard times, good things have come out. And other people have even been affected by your victory and, and by you surviving and you moving on and other people have been encouraged and that's happened to us many different times because they saw how we handled things and we were encouraged because we could empathize and relate to people who have gone through similar painful experiences. That's why God puts us through those hard times often because we can be a witness and that's what he did with Paul and the Christians around him. And it's interesting here in verse 14, Paul doesn't say, in spite of my chains, he says, because of my chains. That's a little more definite. The fact that God reaches people who could only be reached because of something they're going through. It's a part of the plan. 
It's a part of the design. And it also says here in this verse that most of the brothers and sisters are daring to proclaim the gospel without fear. So most, not one or two or even a handful, but most of the church is being raised up because of what Paul's going through and what they're, they're seeing, how they're seeing God work in his life. And the majority of the people in the church at Rome were starting to speak the word of God more boldly because of what was going on, because of persecution, because of something painful. And this isn't talking about preaching necessarily. This is talking about their confidence. They aren't afraid anymore to share the good news of Jesus or talk about him. It's talking about everyday life, everyday conversation. Most of the people in the church were starting, instead of wimping out, they're getting stronger and they're, they're getting more bold in sharing the good hope of Jesus. So these ordinary Christians are responding to Paul's pain and him being in chains, not by shutting down and running away, but by getting out there and talking to people about their hope. And it fired them up and it got them going and it became a part of their everyday conversation. Is Jesus there a part of your everyday conversation? Do our neighbors and our unsaved friends and our loved ones know what we believe and what we stand for? Popular pastor and writer John Piper says this, he says, the world has trained us to keep quiet. It's one of the weaknesses of modern day Christianity. We don't want to offend people. So we keep quiet about Jesus. Remember that your life preaches to people, a good or bad, especially the way we respond to painful circumstances. And our change can serve, can serve to advance the gospel or detract from it. So when we go through hard times, that's when people are watching us, seeing how we're gonna hand, handle it. And if we're miserable and we're kind of cursing God and Person life and everything else, people see that as well as our joy through the hard times. And it's often how we react to pain. Does it bring out the good or does it bring out the bad? And so often out of our pain, we do the opposite. We complain and we gripe and we get depressed. But instead, these Christians in Rome got bolder and they got stronger because of Paul's pain and how God took care of him. So they weren't afraid anymore. So that's the first painful aspect of Paul's life here, is his chains. And yet God could turn that pain into gain. He turned Paul's chains into an opportunity to proclaim the gospel. And so the message starts spreading throughout the palace guards, and they're all talking about it, and the local Christians, they're getting stronger and bolder and starting to share their faith more, and it's all because of Paul's pain. Was it, was it God's will for Paul to suffer, to be in chains, and to be in pain? I guess so. His, his ultimate sovereign will was something good was going to come out of that painful experience. And then we come to number two. Here's the second painful aspect of Paul's life. Yes, he had his chains, but number two, the second pain <laughs> was his critics. Can people be a pain in the you-know-what? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, even Tom, yes. It's an amazing thing here that even though Paul was in prison, he still had other preachers and other Christians who were criticizing him and gossiping about him. So he, he's not really being a pastor in, in, anymore, not really being a missionary anymore. He's in prison for crying out loud and people are still criticizing him. Look at verses 15 to 18. It says, it is true that some people preach Christ 
out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, meaning the negative people, they preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter, Paul says? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or pure, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Well, the story is told of three pastors who were in this boat this one time, and they wanted to be really open and honest with each other. So each of them decided to share their one secret sin. And so the first pastor said, my secret sin, I hate to admit it, is gambling. And the second pastor said, my secret sin is lying. And the third pastor said, my secret sin is gossiping, and I can hardly wait to get off this boat. <laughs> if you've been a Christian for any length of time, and especially if you've been involved in ministry or in church work or being a part of a church, you know you're going to get criticized. You know you're going to have your detractors. You know you're going to have your gossips and your critics. Even the Apostle Paul, this amazing man of God, even when he's in prison, you would think they'd have nothing but fuzzy feelings for him, feeling sorry for him, nothing but love. But even Paul has these detractors. And many a pastor and many a church member and many a church leader has been discouraged and defeated and even quit ministry and given up because of criticism. And yet the Apostle Paul is very practical here. And he tells us that no matter what kind of criticism you might be going through, there's an answer for dealing with it. Guess what the answer is? It's here in verse 18. He says, but what does it matter? The steward vision might be who gives a rip. What does it matter if people are talking behind your back and tearing you down? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or pure, Christ is preached. And because of this, Paul says, I rejoice. And I'll continue to rejoice. Meaning, no matter how bad it gets with the criticism. What does it matter, he says, if people are criticizing? As long as Christ is preached and we're being faithful and as long as we keep going and we don't get sidetracked. Because of course, criticism is a joy stealer. It's a nullifier. It's designed to shut us down and rob us of the joy of the Lord. And for a lot of us, our first reaction, me being number one, my first reaction is to be defensive and take it personally and want to put up the dudes and fight back. But Paul says, what does it really matter? The most important thing is Christ is preached. And God can use, even use people with bad motives. That was his main goal for Paul. If that's our top priority, sharing Jesus, seeing his church grow, getting, seeing people saved, and people coming in, people becoming disciples, who cares about the critics? Because in my life and my ministry, they come and they go. And they come again, and they go again. Kind of like waves, and every once in a while, maybe there might be a tsunami, but what does it matter? Paul is so single-minded here. He was so focused on what the bottom line was, what his mission, what his mandate was. Everything else was secondary, and he could stand back, see the big picture, see that God was using that kind of pain even that kind of pain, even the criticisms, that God was even using Paul's critics to advance the gospel. 
And in this passage, Paul describes two groups of people in this Roman church, and that's usually the case in most churches. He says those who preached out of rivalry or envy and those who preach out of goodwill. Now it might not just be preaching, it might be just people in the church who are there out of envy and rivalry or want goodwill. And the one group, they, they loved Paul, they were on Paul's team and they were on the same page and the other, they, they didn't like him very much to be honest, and they were sort of out to, uh, to get them. They weren't necessarily false teachers. That's what's interesting as I read through this. You know, we hear a lot about in the New Testament about false teachers. No, these people were still in the church. They were still a part of the Roman church. They were fellow Christians, but they weren't on Paul's team. They weren't united. They didn't have the same focus and they stand in opposition to Paul, right in the same church. And guess what? There's nothing new under the sun, of course, because many churches today struggle with the same kind of thing where there's a bit of little criticism and rivalry and jealousy, both ways, not necessarily just from the people to the front, but pastors as well are not immune. And maybe in this case, maybe some people were kind of jealous of Paul because of his success in ministry or whatever it was. This group took advantage of him being down. They took advantage of him being in prison and being vulnerable. So what were they doing? Like a lot of people do, they were kicking him when he was down. And it says in verse 17, they were wanting to stir up trouble. And that's why Paul says in verse 18, whether it's from false motives or pure, who cares? He didn't care about their motivation or their petty attitudes or their criticism. All he cared about was Jesus being preached. And that's where his joy came from. And that's what we need to do as well. We need to have that in our heads. I am not going to let criticism steal my joy in the Lord and rob me and I'm not going to get sidetracked I'm not going to get sucked in to something like that and especially if we're being criticized for doing something for God or serving him or trying to do the right thing who really cares Paul says that's biblical not to care in the right in the right sense <laughs> God can still bring gain out of that kind of pain, out of that kind of criti criticism, as long as I don't lose the big picture and get sidetracked. Because that's what, that's what that is designed to do, get you off track, get you consumed with those problems and those criticisms. And as long as I keep my priorities right, as long as I know the most important thing is to share Christ and to see him preached and honored and lifted up, give him glory that he deserves to see his kingdom come. That's all that really matters in the long run. Let people say what they're going to say. So we've looked at Paul's first pain, that he was in chains and God used that captivity and that pain to spread the gospel even to all the imperial guards and to encourage the Christians to be more courageous and bold in sharing their faith and he can even use our chains in the same way. And then we looked at Paul's second pain, that was his critics and God used even that and brought about gain by motivating even the critics to preach more. And then number three, we have the third painful aspect of Paul's life, and that was his crisis. And we often go through those once in a while. And if you look at verses 20 to 23, it says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, 
Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And here it is, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For Paul, even to die would be gain. So everything else besides death is gain for Paul. He says, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me, yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for me that I remain in the body. So what was Paul's crisis? Well, at the end of verse 20, he says, so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So he's in prison. There's the possibility that he might be executed for his faith. This is a life and death crisis that he's in, in jail. What happens when we're usually in a crisis? It becomes all consuming overwhelming, all-encompassing. That's all we can think about. That's all, all we dwell on. And yet Paul's main concern here, his main focus wasn't the crisis he was in. It was how Jesus would be exalted through it all. So he's not concerned about his own life or his body or his physical well-being. Just like Jesus himself said, don't fear the one who can kill the body. Meaning, don't fear people, don't fear men, fear God. So Paul's joy comes from knowing that God could work either through his life or through his death. And that's where our joy can come from too. If we exalt the Lord and we trust him and we live for him, knowing that God can work through my crisis, even if it is a left, a life and death one, and there's that key verse, verse 21 again, it says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you were really honest with yourself this morning, right now, and we left that spot where the name of Christ is, we left it blank, what would it be? For me to live is blank. For me to live is my family. For me to live is my job. For me to live is my pension plan. For me to live, you could put anything in there. If we were totally honest, maybe it would be something other than Christ. But when a crisis hits, and some of those things that we have had in that blank get taken away, only living for Jesus, only trusting Him, only exalting Him can lead to lasting joy. And Paul believed that even his chains and his critics and his crisis, even those things could result in gain and joy. If God was his priority and if spreading the good news and telling people about Jesus and being faithful to the cause of Christ, if Jesus was his life, then everything else was extra. I always say, everything else was gravy. Everything else was gain. There was an old chorus we used to sing in the 70s. If I give you Jesus, I give you everything. If Jesus is my life, everything else is going to be gain. Do I get an amen? amen. 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 Do you believe that? Yes. Paul believed it. And God was there for him. And he had God's joy all the way through. And I, I would just like to say before I pray, I'd just like to say, if there's anyone here this morning or anyone watching later on, Brock tells me we're getting about 30 people at least watching uh, our YouTube channel for the Sunday service. 
If there's anyone watching and you have never really put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've never really accepted him as your personal savior and turned from yourself and turned from your sin and repented, I pray that today, even now, you would do that and you would have that same gain. You'd have that same joy that we're talking about that can see you through. And that's our, that's our hope. That's why we're here. We want to live in that joy. We want to live in that message and that hope that we proclaim. There's no other message like it because everything else in this world comes up short. So let's just pray together and just come before the Lord now in prayer. Father, we thank you. We praise you for the God that you are. You are the sovereign Lord. You know all things. Before they happen, you are the transcendent God and you have a plan and a purpose. And even in our pain with the crisis that we go through and the, the critics and our chains, Lord, you know all about it. And you have a plan and a purpose to use those things ultimately for good, to bring us joy instead of sorrow and misery. Lord, we pray that you would encourage our hearts as believers today, that you would lift us up, that you would help us to be more focused and more centered on you. As Tom said earlier, centered on the cross, centered on Jesus Christ. May we wake up every morning and have that wonderful joy, the joy of the Lord in our hearts, in spite of what's going on around us. So Lord, I ask a blessing on each one here. Speak to each heart, we pray. Draw us close. Provide for us this week. Go ahead of us and help us to be rejoicing daily, moment by moment, in the hope that we have in Jesus that out of our pain can come ultimate gain and glory and happiness and hope. And so we commit ourselves to you now in the precious name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.